acceptance, invite you to have a date with Judy. Here's Judy Foster again. So far, she's lived 16 years, and life has been a whirl the whole way. Right now, she's in a special summer class in domestic science over at City High School. We are preparing ourselves for women's place in the world, and that, of course, includes the rearing and training of children. Judy Foster. Yes, sister. The workings of the underground in occupied Norway are of nothing compared with what is going on in this class. I don't know what you mean, Mr. Is this a class in domestic science, or is this a class in note writing? It's a class in domestic science. So you ought to know the teacher. Judy, you wouldn't have had to take so much trouble to send a note to Mr. You could simply have read it aloud to her in the first place. Like you're going to do now. But Goofy, if I read it to Mr., everybody else will hear you. That was the idea. Read it, Judy. Well, all right. But you won't like it. I'm sure I won't like it. Let's read it anyhow. Well, Quote, Dear Mitzi, I think your dream man is a fool. <laughs> My type of dream man is Gerald Putnam, who is the most unfitty man I ever saw. Are you sure you want me to go on, Miss Putnam? I'm positive. Well, quote, I'd give anything to snag a date with him if he has strictly not given me a tumble up to date. Just sincerely, Judy Foster, unquote. That's all. That is enough. Now, could we return to domestic science? Well, gee, Miss Whistle, if you don't think about dreaming, you don't get married. And if you don't get married, you don't have any domestic science to worry about. Judy! No, oh, gee, Miss Whistle, you probably didn't think about dreaming when you were young, and you didn't get married. Judy, I don't want to hear another word from you. Now, return to our class work and the hypothetical problem of baiting a baby. Sorry, we could have been married, but I want to Now, Missy. <laughs> What is the first thing one does when one bathes a baby? One undresses it. Naturally. And after that? One places some water in one's bassinet, and then one sticks the baby in the water. <laughs> ah, but the water. One tests it for temperature. Very good. Judy? One puts the thermometer in the water, and if it says 96 degrees, it's okay. And if one doesn't have a thermometer, one sticks in one's elbow. And if one, one's elbow feels about 69 degrees, I mean 96 degrees, yes. one goes ahead and sticks the baby in the water. <laughs> quite right. I see if one can put dream men out of one's mind, one is quite able to concentrate on domestic science. I still think one's got to concentrate on a dream man before domestic science is very practical. On account of your... Judy! Judy! <laughs> We're off on another date with Judy, chaperoned by Tepsidon. And in a moment, we'll see where concentration on dream men will lead Judy. You know, the direct opposite of a dream man in Judy's set is a drip. Now, a drip is an ick with no personality, no sunny smile. And why no sunny smile? Dingy teeth, that's the trouble. On the other hand, the lads who use Tepsidon toothpaste have the brightest, sparklingest smiles there are. Yes, sir, Tepsidon with Irium is the super cleanser that speeds up results. It makes teeth not only look cleaner, but feel cleaner than they've ever felt before. It gives your mouth a wonderful feeling of freshness, too. There's no excuse for anybody to go around with dingy teeth when it's so easy to keep them really clean with Tepsodent. It's so easy to have a bright, beautiful Tepsodent smile. If that's what you'd like tomorrow, well, go to your drug counter tonight and say, Tepsodent toothpaste, please. And now, let's get back to that date with Judy. <laughs> We're in the kitchen, dear. Oh, right, Mother. I can bathe the baby. Oh, how nice, dear. Now, if you only had a baby, Randolph. <laughs> this is a hypothetical baby you gave some class. Did it get hypothetical, please? Mother, please make Randolph stop discouraging me. Uh, Randolph, uh, stop discouraging, Judy. I'm not discouraging her. I'm just trying to find out how good she is at bathing a baby. Oh, why, dear? Because my dog hasn't been washed in three months. <laughs> Are you trying to get me to wash your dog? Well, the dog's mighty smelly. My field is baby. Mother, I have a wonderful idea. I could go in the baby-minding business. Oh, no, not that. Think of the future generations. People are always looking for somebody to come in and mind their baby. I could charge 25 cents an hour, and if I worked seven nights every week... And went out on dates in the daytime. Oh, that's right. Oh, well, 
That would have been a good idea. Maybe some night when I don't have a date, I'll do it. Well, I'm sure glad my cradle days are over. <laughs> Judy, I drummed up some business for you. Business? What kind of business? Baby minding business. Mr. and Mrs. Hess have to go to their sister's wedding, and they want you to come over and take care of their baby this afternoon and stay all evening until they get home. But I might still get a date for tonight. Mrs. Hess will pay 30 cents an hour, Judy. 30 cents an hour? Why, that's a nickel more than I planned on charging. Well, don't change your plans. The nickel is for me, for getting you the job. <laughs> Now, you know what to do, Judy. Give him his bottle now, and then at 6 o'clock again, and at 10 o'clock tonight. Can I bathe him, Mrs. Hess? No, it won't be necessary. He had his bath this morning. Now, here are the bottles in the refrigerator, and just keep them in the bottle warmer. I know how to give a baby a bath. He's perfectly clean. Judy, are you sure I can trust you to like him home? Oh, absolutely, Mrs. Hess. You don't need to give the baby another thought. I've been taking care of a hypothetical baby in domestic science for the last two weeks. I know simply everything. Well, if my husband didn't want to go to his sister's wedding so much, I'd stay home. But nothing could possibly go wrong. Nothing went wrong in domestic science. Yes, well, all right. Don't forget his bottle. You can have the most implicit trust in me. Well, goodbye, Judy. Bye. I can got a pain. Has in little baby got a pain in that the old tummy. Yes, what? got a pain in nasty old tum tum. Oh, it's you, Randolph. For a moment, I thought the baby was talking. What are you doing here? Oh, I just thought I'd stop in and see how well you're minding the baby. I've got to look out for my commission. You know, I think I'll give the baby a bath. Does it need it? Well, its mother said it didn't. She said to give it a bottle. I think it ought to have one of the other. Is it a boy baby or a girl baby? It's a boy baby. Are you sure? Well, its name's Chester. Give it a bottle. <laughs> Now, what I came over here mainly to tell you is that I detect a little item in the newspaper which reads as follows. Baby contest this afternoon. $25 prize for most beautiful baby. Honestly, Randolph? Why, that's wonderful. We could enter Chester. Well, he isn't very beautiful. My enthusiasm for the contest has practically petered out since I saw him. Never mind. <laughs> Randolph, you have a great idea. I'll get the baby ready right away. Come on, Peter. Kim's going to look mighty pretty. Kim's going to be in booty. Randolph, he's kind of, you know, well, don't look at me. <laughs> Mrs. Hess gave you the directions about what to do in an emergency. Oh, I don't think I'll bother. After all, they'll just look at him at the contest. Well, put his hat on and hurry up. There, he's got his pretty on and on. Well, we're ready. My, won't everybody be surprised when they hear we won the baby contest? Yeah, and won't they be goggle-eyed when they hear we kept the 25 bucks? Oh, oh, oh. Mm, look at the mess of babies. I feel kind of out of place, Judy. I like dog shows better than this. We aren't concerned with dogs today, Randolph. We're concerned with babies. Entrance register here. Oh, uh, how do you do? I'd like to enter this baby in the contest. Well, how do you do? I'm Mr. Singer, the judge. So you want to enter your baby. My, how young you are to be a mother. Yes, isn't she? <laughs> uh, may I have your name, madam? Judy Foster. Foster. And the baby's name, madam? Chester. And his age, madam? Five months. Oh, that's fine, madam. Now, just go over there to the last seat and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. The judge, that's me, is ready to begin. And good luck, madam. I wish you'd stop calling me madam. Oh, sit down and hold him in your lap. Well, the judge is starting down the line. Gee, Judy, I'm terribly nervous. Isn't there something we ought to do to the baby to help him win the prize? Do it to him? Well, when I entered my dog in a contest, I stood him on the floor and pointed his tail. Well, you can't do that to a baby. Well, we ought to do something. He looks terrible. You think he looks better lying down or with me holding him up? At the dog show, I made my dog stand up on his hind legs. The judge is getting closer. You know, I'd feel a lot better about it if we'd have fed this baby raw eggs for a few weeks beforehand. Makes the coat so much glossier. <laughs> Randolph. My goodness, Chester will never win the prize if the judge hears you talking like this. And now, Chester Foster, five months. Oh, fine, little fellow. Aren't you going to see those biceps? Well, uh, no. The contest is based purely upon appearance. Well, I guess our goose is cooked. 
Well, this is the last one. I'll now go into a huddle and decide the winner. Hmm. Meanwhile, will everybody please place their baby on the blanket in the center of the room so the photographers can photograph them all together? Gee, he's going to have his picture took. We'll bring him over here, Judy. Sit him down someplace in this squawking mess. Look, Randolph. Here's a baby with a bonnet, just like Chester's. Now, this is no time to worry about millinery. And now, everybody, while the photographer sets up his camera, I wish to announce the results of the contest. Oh. First prize of $25, baby Dorothy Johnson. Oh, oh no, that's better. Yes, a little gloss. Second prize of the blue ribbon, baby Chester Foster. Oh, dear, one second prize. Oh, Jesus, what do we want with the blue ribbon? I don't know, but my visions of living in wealth for the rest of my life are paid in town. Randolph, let's get out of here. Before the photographer took just a picture and Mrs. Hurt finds out about this. There's no use taking any risk. Okay, grab Chester and let's climb. Here he is. Come on, hurry, you man. Gee, I'm glad you're out of there. Oh, imagine that dumb man getting such a blue ribbon. What do you think he is? A cow? <laughs> Randolph, I think that's just the bed. Nobody's all tied up and you set me leaving. Please, Chester, what a dud you turned after me. Randolph! Huh? Look at Chester. Does he look sort of strange to you? Yeah. He doesn't look like Chester at all. Randolph! We're going home the wrong baby. <laughs> Judy's troubles with the baby mining business are becoming a bit hectic, and somehow they remind me of my worst trouble. It happened when I tried one of those toothbrushes with the stiff, scratchy bristles. I couldn't break it in. Finally, I gave up and threw it away. Now, a petulant 50 tough toothbrush would have saved me all that trouble, because the nylon bristles in the petulant toothbrush are gentle. They're kind to your mouth, but they're not wishy-washy. They give you extra cleansing power because... 50 tufts of gentle bristles are united for strength. So, if you want the best feeling, smoothest working, and most efficient toothbrush you've ever used, get a Pepsodent 50 tuft toothbrush at your store tonight. And get that bonus for buying it. Remember, packed in every Pepsodent 50 tuft toothbrush container is a cash certificate good for 10 cents in extra spending money. And now, let's get back to that date we have with Judy. I ever made. Mrs. Hess isn't going to like it at all. My goodness, don't you ever look at anything but a baby's hat? Well, you were there too. You could have looked. Gee, I can't understand it. I picked him up and made it the bun. Well, we got to do something. Got to get the right baby back. Can't just sit here and post mortem. See, I hope that isn't Mrs. Hess. Hello? Judy? Call your home just now. Tell me where you were. This is Gerald Putnam. Gerald Putnam? See you in. Man. Oh, Gerald, that's an absolute vicious lie. Oh, I got it on good authority. Listen, how about a date? A date? Gee, I'd love to, Gerald, but I'm minding a baby. And I just got him mixed up with another baby, and now I've got to get the right baby back. If you want to help me, you can. Well, it sounds like a novel way to me. It's different, you know. Well, then come over here to the Hesse house. Okay, I'll be right over. Oh, sure. Randolph, Gerald's coming over to help me get this with Oh, I'll go home. Randolph, why did you get that funny stuff on your face? Well, I was just wondering what happened at the baby contest when some kid's mother found the wrong baby under his bonnet. Oh, Jesus. Well, I think I'll go home. See, Randolph, I'm worried. Well, don't worry. The penalty for kidnapping isn't so bad. Only the death sentence. <laughs> Now, now, do try and control yourself, Mrs. DeLucy. But this isn't my baby, Mr. Tinker. Somebody put my bonnet on this baby and stole my Eleanor. Well, keep calm. I'm, I'm sure there must be some very simple explanation of it, Mrs. DeLucy. And where's my baby? If it's so simple as to me that, where's my Eleanor? If you'll just let me think. Now, let's see my particle. 
This baby is Chester Foster. I know because I was just about to award it second prize. But Mrs. Foster left without waiting for the photographer. Of course he left. Because he stole my own order, that's why. Let's not say stole, Mrs. Delucci. This is a very respectable baby contest. He stole it. Come now, we must be ready. Why should she prefer one baby to another? Because my baby is a better baby than her baby. <laughs> now, now, now. Remember, her baby won second prize and yours didn't. <laughs> my baby should have won second prize. He should have won first prize. Now, now, Mrs. Delucci, the judge's decision is final. I don't care. I want my Eleanor back. Oh, oh. Now, now, just be very calm. It's so simple. I'll just go to the phone and call Mrs. Foster, and I'm sure as soon as she realizes her mistake, she'll return your Eleanor to you at once. Oh, no, no, no. There's nothing to it at all. Hello? Hello. Is this Mrs. Foster? Yes, it is. Oh, oh. I'm so glad I was able to reach you. Uh, Mrs. Foster, I want you to do uh, be quiet, Randolph. Uh, what was it you wanted me to do? I want you to look at your baby. My baby? <laughs> oh, all right, I'm looking at him. Uh -huh. Are you sure he's your baby? Well, of course I'm sure he's my baby. Well, uh, look again. Are you positively sure? What is this? If it's a practical joke, I don't think it's very funny. Now, I want to ask you something. A boy, of course. <laughs> oh, there's where you're wrong. The baby is a <laughs> Yes, that baby's a girl. It's Mrs. Delucci's baby. Mrs. Delucci? Why, this is ridiculous. Who is this? Why, well, this is Mr. Singer. I just awarded your baby second prize at the baby contest. Remember? I certainly do not. I think you have the wrong number. Goodbye. Of all the crazy things. Why to tell me you're a girl, Randolph? He's talking about baby contest. He but uh, baby contest. Wait a minute, baby. Yes, ma'am. Randolph, where's Judy? Now there's an interesting question. <laughs> Randolph, I don't want any of your heading. Out of it. Has Judy done something to the head, baby? Well, let's look at the matter closely. Yes, I'm implicated too. Tell me, Randolph, and tell me quick. Well, I guess I'd better. Judy and I took the Hess baby to a contest. And by mistake, we brought home the wrong baby. Oh, no. Judy's out with Gerald Putnam trying to re-switch the baby. Oh, for the love of heaven. Look, I'm going out and find Judy. And you stay right here, Randolph. Oh, don't worry. After this, I'm not going near her baby. Because she's at least 18. <laughs> Singer. Where's the baby? The baby? You give me back my Eleanor. Here's your baby. Hey, yes, ma'am. Hi, sister. Now give me back my baby. Well, I, I couldn't do that just at the moment. Now, come, come. Let's unravel this whole perturbing mess. This is Mrs. Delucci, and she's come for her child. Now, where's Mrs. Foster? She's out. Out? My, and I got no satisfaction at all from her on the telephone. Baby is. Look here. You're certainly the boy who was with Mrs. Foster at the contest. Oh, yeah. now, oh, oh don't bother with him. Search the house. All right, all right. You go upstairs, Mrs. Delucci, and I'll look over here. Oh. Oh, nice seeing you again. Oh, bye, bye. Oh. <laughs> hey, Captain. While they're looking around, what do you say you and I scram over to your house? Oh, why, sir? In one quick switch, we'll straighten this whole thing out. We'll get you home and get Mrs. Delucci's baby out of Judy's place. Boy. Boy. Now, where did he go? And where's the baby we left with him? Mrs. Delucci! Mrs. Delucci! <laughs> Something terrible has happened. Now we must be so baby. <laughs> The baby. Oh, go away, Tony. I'm in a hurry. God, I'm so hungry. <laughs> I expected to see you carrying a baby, Randolph Foster. Oh, 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 oh. 
Why, you sure look funny. Can you play? Do you gotta follow me every place I go? Where are you bringing this house for? <laughs> because Chester lives here. Chester is this here infant. Judy! Hey, Judy! Oh, Trump and Juniper, I would get stuck with a baby on my hand. <laughs> you look real demented, Randolph. <laughs> You gotta mind this baby for a while. <laughs> Where are you going? I gotta find my sister Judy. Now don't let this baby out of your sight. Stay right here. Go ahead and play it, Chester. I look domestic. Oh, hello, Miss Foster. Shirley, what are you doing here? I'm minding the baby. Well, you can stop right now. I'm taking it back where it belongs. Doesn't it belong here, Mrs. Foster? It certainly does not. It belongs to a Mrs. DeLucci, and I'm going to take it right back to her. But, Mrs. Foster... Goodness, I don't know how Judy could have mistaken one baby for another. Well, for well, goodness sake... <laughs> I thought somebody would be at the baby contest, but they were all gone. Well, you can tell Mrs. Hesh you tried to get her baby back. Oh, Gerald, I'll never be able to face you. I'll tell you what. Let's go back to Mrs. Hesh's house. You've still got this baby. Maybe she won't notice the difference. Of course she'll notice. Judy! Hey, Judy! Oh, I've been looking all over for you. What do you want, Linda? Come on to Mrs. Hesh's house, quick! I got Chester back. You did? That's wonderful, You Randall. grab this baby. Oh, come on, Judy, let's run. We can't take any chances on making connections this time. See that baby he's up there? His name is Delucci. His mother's been screaming all over the place. Your mother's been screaming all over the place, too, Judy. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, boy, I sure got my fingers crossed. Here we are. Now, where's Chester? Jesus! He was right here, I think. Well, Curly is here. Maybe we added this same old, what's his name? Felucci. Oh, gee. There's been a mighty lot of baby snatching going on. You know, I wonder if whoever snatched Chester just now snatched Curly, too. Curly's very... Carly, where have you been? I've been around. Well, I wish you'd been around Chester. Somebody took him. Your mother did. Her mother? Yeah, she said he belonged to Mrs. Uh, DeLucci or something like that. She just took the baby and walked out. Well, you're some baby miner, you are. Well, well, sure. What John Maple said, she's over to Spruce. There's no way she is now. Well, sure, I just came back from there. Well, lead us through it. Colossal mess in the history of man. Gee, what'll we do, Gerald? We can't just walk in and say, how do you do, here's your baby, give us ours. They'd arrest us. It's something worse, maybe. Well, let's meet in the back and I'll push the trigger. I can see That's a good idea, Gerald. Come on. No, it's Curly. Take Randolph. Well, Gerald, I'm now go right down and do the sequence in a little clip. Judy will sing you a nice song. Dum, 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 dum. Baby's asleep, now baby's asleep. Judy, Judy, we're home. Oh, hello, Mrs. Hatch. Come on in. That's what you see. Oh, look at the little darling. Sound asleep. Well, Judy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking care of Chester. Poor child, you must have had a very dull day. <laughs> oh, it was all right. <laughs> oh, my Chester looks contented. You must have taken marvelous care of him. He's sleeping peacefully as a little angel. I guess maybe he's tired. <laughs> oh, what would he have to be tired about after a peaceful day at home, the little darling? <laughs> Judy, oh, I thought I'd meet you on the way home. Listen, I've got the most amazing news. What's wrong, Randolph? Oh, nothing's wrong. Listen, the baby that won first prize was disqualified for being overage. And Mr. Singer just called to say Chester won first prize. He did? Yeah. And I went right over to Mr. Singer's house and got the dough. Twenty-five dollars. Count them. Oh, my. Oh, it's funny. For heaven's sake. <laughs> Gee, I hardly feel right about keeping the dough. You know, Randolph, what I think would be the fair thing to do? What? Not to charge Mrs. Hess for taking care of the baby.
Well, that's that. Oh, Randolph. Randolph, what were you doing five years ago today? Sorry, Mr. Keating, I hadn't any idea. Really observant. Well, five years is a long time, and it's easy to forget things. But what about those five years? Have they been pleasant ones for you? Oh, sure. Everything has been just swell. Well, that's because you've been one of the lucky ones, Randolph. And I wouldn't want to change that for anything. But here's something that all true Americans should try to change. For five years, things haven't been so swell for some real friends of ours, the Chinese people. Five years ago today, Japan launched its brutal assault on China. For five long years, China has been fighting to save her freedom from the Japs. And those years have been horrible ones for the Chinese people. More than three million Chinese soldiers have been killed. Soldiers like your sons, brothers, and husbands. Fifty million Chinese civilians are homeless. People who are as peaceable and home-loving as you and your neighbors. Two million Chinese children are orphans. Helpless, innocent children just like yours. No, things haven't been so swell in China. Let's do all we can to change that. You can help relieve the suffering there by contributing to United China Relief. And when you do, remember this. Not only does China need us, but we need China. If the Chinese front falls, our hope of a short war falls with it. So put it on the basis of giving tangible evidence of American friendship to the Chinese people. Put it on the basis of insurance against the invasion of our shores and the bombing of our homes and factories. Put it on any basis you want. United China Relief deserves, yes, demands your support. Send your money to your local United China Relief chairman or the United China Relief, 1790 Broadway, New York, New York. Good night, Judy. Remember, you all have another date with Judy come Tuesday next. A date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Jerome Lawrence and Aline Lester. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day, see your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. <laughs> this program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Okay. All right, that concludes the first episode of the night. I hope you all liked it, and uh, take your five-minute break, and we'll be back then. Yeah.
that concludes our five minute break. I hope you like the music and uh, let's get to episode two of the night. Yay, woo. And invite you to have a date with Judy. Did you ever attend a high school sorority meeting? If not, you're going to attend one right now. It's Judy Foster sorority, and there is plenty going on. Madam President, there's some new business I'd like to bring up. We haven't finished the old business yet, Sister Judy. To heck with old business. This is utterly vital to the future of the sorority. Okay, Sister Judy, what is it you wish to bring up? Men. Again? Gee, Sister Judy, every time you bring something up, it's man. I can't help it. This time it's devastating news. What's happened, Judy? This year, the boys have decided to make their annual July picnic a stag affair. A stag? A stag? A stag? Oh. You mean without women? It's a terrific insult to our beauty and intelligence and charm. Gee, and I had a new personality all dreamed out just to spring at that picnic. Girls, we've got to take this matter into our own hands. I move the sorority goes out on strike. On strike? Yes. We won't date him and we won't talk to him. But what do we do with all our time? Well, we can... Well, we can be career women. Career women? But then we'd have to work. Yes, but once we're earning big salaries, the boys will realize we can be utterly independent of them. Madam Chairman, I call for an immediate vote. All those in favor of going out on strike right away indicate by saying... Now, wait a minute, Judy Foster. This is not according to parliamentary procedure. Besides, there's something else sort of stinky going on. Why, Madam Chairman, what do you mean? I mean that you and Gerald Putman had a fight, didn't you? Well, what's that got to do with it? Wasn't he seen the other night with that redhead from Glendale High School? I don't care if he was. Madam President, this is nothing personal. It's just that a stag picnic is an attack on all womanhood. It is? It's the beginning of a trend. I've seen it coming for a long time. Why, men treat girls just like, like anybody else. You're right, and sometimes even worse than that. If it'll help us get to the picnic, maybe we ought to go out on strike. If it'll help me get a date ever, maybe we ought to go out on strike. <laughs> Madam President, I call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Nay. Motion carried. That settles it. From now on, we're on strike. No more men. <laughs> Jeepers, we're off to a ghoulish start. It looks as if our date with Judy tonight is going to be something for the books. And here's a problem that's usually something for the chemistry books. What's NaPO3 taken X times plus Ca3PO4 taken two times? Well, that's not as ghoulish as it sounds. It's the reason why some girls have brighter smiles than others. It's composite metaphosphate, the marvelous polishing ingredient that makes teeth shine and sparkle. And Pepsodent is the only tooth powder in the world that contains this ingredient. That's why no other tooth powder can match the results you get with Pepsodent. Independent laboratories tested dozens of tooth powders. And in every case, the same fact was proved. Pepsodent produces a luster on teeth twice as bright as the average of all other leading brands. So it's just simple arithmetic. If a girl's teeth are twice as bright, her smile is twice as sparkling. Everybody who wants a dazzling smile... Go to your drug counter tonight and say, Pepsodent Tooth Powder, please. Remember, you don't have to exchange an empty can or tube when you get Pepsodent Tooth Powder. And now, let's get back to that date we have with Judy. Here we are, Mitzi. Frankly, Judy, I'm not sure I want a career. But, Mitzi, if we give up men, we've got to do something. And I think it would be spelled swell being a telegraph girl. Gee, I don't know, Judy. Look, it says right there in the window, girls wanted must be able to sing. But, Judy, I really don't have a trained voice. It doesn't say trained voice. It just says must be able to sing. Come on in. Ah, how do you do? We saw your sign in the window, and we'd like to apply for jobs. Ah, uh, good. We're looking for a telegraph girl. Been having some difficulty lately. There's a shortage of boys, you know. Isn't that funny? We've been having the same trouble. <laughs> uh, shall we have a little audition? <laughs> now, who wants to be first? Go ahead, Mitzi. All right, young lady. Uh, suppose you had to deliver this. A special congratulations 342A. It's to the tune of, do you know, 
Would you care in John Peel? Who? John Peel. You know it, of course. Well, not personally. <laughs> Shall we try? Uh, try to get spirit and feeling into it. I'll give you the pitch. We wish you happiness. We wish you joy. We hope you have a baby boy. And when it's there, begins to grow. We hope you have a baby girl. Congratulations. <laughs> My, uh, you don't have much range, do you? I, I could practice. I'm very sorry. I don't think you'll do. Uh, tough next. Luck, I'm ready. What do you want me to sing? Let us grapple with a message which presents a real challenge. A number 342C. It's to the tune of Happy Birthday to You. And here's the pitch. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary, Mr. and Mrs. Kendall, Lass, Thurston and family. Happy 22nd wedding anniversary to you. And gee, do they get all that for 26 cents? <laughs> Young lady, you're just what we've been looking for. Now get your uniform and report for service immediately. Jeepers, Judy, you've been drafted. <laughs> Well, what are you supposed to be? I'm a telegraph girl. When did all this happen, Judy? This afternoon. I just got my uniform. Do we have to salute you? Certainly not, Randolph. Don't be silly. Well, to what do we owe this sudden change in your personality? <gasps> Father, what time is it? Uh, five after seven. Why? Mother, tell Father I can't speak to him anymore. Our strike deadline was seven o'clock tonight. Strike? Against men. Uh, against men? Yes, the whole sorority went out on strike tonight, and I can't speak to Father because technically he's a man. Uh, what do you mean, technically? Well, you see, the boys are having a stag picnic and not inviting us, so we're going out on strike against them. We're not going to date them or talk to them. <laughs> oh, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> Randolph, tell Father this is a very serious matter. Uh, Randolph? Well, isn't he technically a man? Well, during the strike, we've got to have some means of communication with the outside world, so... The sorority has hired Randolph as I go between. Morally, I'm still on the man side of this, Father. But the girls are career women now, and, well, money talks. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a mediator, huh, Randolph? <laughs> sure. What has the NLRB got that I haven't got? <laughs> Hi, girls. And you, too, Madam President. I can only give you a few minutes of my time. I have some very important telegrams to deliver tonight. Really, Miss Career Woman, you shouldn't waste so much valuable time on us. Randolph will be here any moment to give us a report. A report on what? A report on how the boys are taking our strike. I only hope the boys don't find out how we're taking our strike. Hello, Winches. Here's Randolph. Hello, Randolph. <laughs> Boy, have I got some dirt to dish. Are the boys positively gaga? I'm not passing out any free adjectives, Winches. All information is strictly COD. 25 cents, please, in advance. How do we know you've got anything to tell us? Madam President, I just spent a full hour in Scully's drugstore. Let's know your Julie boyfriend's drool. All right, all right, here's your quarter. <laughs> what did Gerald Putnam say? Let me see. Uh, Gerald Putnam, he said like this. Gee, I wish Judy let me talk to her. Did he really say that? Yes, I think it was Judy he said. Huh? No, it might have been I wish Janie let me talk to her. Or maybe it was Sadie. What did Mervyn say? Mervyn, he said like this, Scully, bring me another chocolate marshmallow super duper. Is that all? He's a very quiet youth. <laughs> Did you see Howard Teichman there? Oh, yes. Was he miserable about me not talking to him? Howard Teichman, Madam President, he said like this, I think this strike's a good idea. It saves us guys so much money. I don't believe it. You're a nasty little boy. Okay, by me. If that's the way you feel, Madam President, I resign. With certain information now in my possession, I can get a job anytime with the boys. So long, wenches. Well, what do you want, young lady? I have a telegram from Mr. Schwartz. He's supposed to be here at the athletic club in a meeting. Well, I guess he's here, but you can't see him. Why not? Well, because you're a girl, ain't you? No girls are allowed to stag party. A what? A stag party. That's where he is. Honest? Yep. Do you believe in stag parties? 
Well, I ain't for him. Uh, but I ain't again him. Well, I'm again him. How am I ever going to deliver this telegram? Could I sneak in real quick and then sneak out real quick again? Nope. But uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sneak in and sneak out again. <laughs> Mister, what happens at stag parties? Uh, you ever been in a hen party? Oh, sure, lots of times. Well, it's the same thing, only uh, kind of a masculine kind of way. Here, I'll open the door and you take a peek. Oh, swell. Gee, just a bunch of men singing and stuff. Yep. Oh, sometimes I wish they'd do something interesting. Well, I guess I'll take that telegram into Mrs. Schwartz. Good morning, Judy. Good morning, Mother. Ah, it's Miss Mercury. Did you sleep well, dear? No. I was delivering telegrams all night in my sleep. Oh, well. After delivering them all day and then again last evening, no wonder. Yes, I delivered six and a half messages last evening alone. Six and a half? How can you deliver half a message? What happened, dear? Well, the man the telegram was addressed to was in a stag party at the athletic club, and the watchman kind of helped me deliver it. Did you say a stag party at the athletic club? Yes. There were a lot of men who were playing cards and laughing and singing and everything. What were they singing? Oh, like this. Dum, 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 dum. Oh, they were. That's not Tchaikovsky. There's a certain husband of mine named Melvin Foster who couldn't take me out last night because he had to go to a political meeting at the athletic club. What Judy probably heard was a campaign song. I'd like to hear the tune he sings when he comes down to breakfast. Heads up, everybody. By a wonderful coincidence, here comes Father now. Uh, 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 well, good morning, everybody. How's everything this bright and cheery morning? Hmm? <laughs> well, what's the matter? What are you looking at me like that for? Well, isn't anybody going to talk to me? Well, what is the matter here? Melvin, how was that political meeting you attended last night. Oh, a corker. Best discussion of world affairs I've heard in a long time. Mm. <laughs> well, then maybe you can tell me whose national anthem this is. la dee 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 Oh, where have you been? <laughs> where have I been? Where have you been? That's what I want to know. Judy. Yes, Mother? What is it you girls are doing since your men started sagging it? We're on strike. We don't date him and we don't talk to him. Randall, will you please inform your father that I'm not talking to him and I'm not going out to him on any more dates. Beginning right now, I'm on strike, too. Shall I deliver that as a straight message or as a singing telegram? <laughs> Judy will be back in just a minute to untangle all this wire trouble. Now, I'd like to send a telegram myself. It's addressed to a man named Case, who's so cross, they call him Crank Case. No, really, they do. And here's the message. Quote, understand you always frown. Stop. Let me tell you about a man who was as grouchy as you, but who now is all sweetness and light. He used to have trouble after trouble with toothbrush. Scratchy ones gouged his gums. Droopy ones bogged down on his teeth. Then he tried a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush. It's the brush that makes people glad to brush their teeth because it feels so good. The nylon bristles are gentle, not scratchy. They're springy and alive. And 50 tufts of them are united to clean teeth better than they were ever cleaned before. Get a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush for every member of your family. And with every brush, you'll receive a cash certificate worth 10 cents extra spending money. A 10 cent bonus for you. And now... Straighten your tie, because we're off again on that date with Judy. Hey, Randolph. Oh, well, hello, Gerald. Are you spying on me? Well, yes, in a nice sort of way. Are you working for the sorority? Well, I don't exactly have a social security number, but I suppose I could be construed as being employed. Well, I've been watching your work, Randolph, and I'd like to make you a little offer. How would you like to come over on our side? 
Friend, if you can match the pay, you can consider me working for you as of now. Swell. Well, get to work. I have a killer of an idea to break the strike. But it's worth a quarter if it's worth a nickel. I'll give you a nickel. This is strictly a two-bit idea. Well, that's big dough. But this is a big idea. Frankly, Gerald, it's not the money. My sister Judy hasn't had a date for four nights. And, friend, if she doesn't get out of the house soon, I'll go back. Well, all right. What's the idea? Well, since my sister Judy's a telegraph girl... <laughs> Miss Foster, here's a telegram to be delivered to Mr. Gerald Putnam. To Gerald Putnam? Oh, I can't deliver to him. I'm not on speaking terms with him. Well, if you don't have to speak to him, you merely have to sing. Technically, it's the same thing. Miss Foster, have you ever heard those sacred lines? Neither rain, nor snow, nor sleet, nor gloom of night can stay these faithful couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Jesus, that's beautiful. Then chin up, out into the rain and snow... Why, Mr. Sawyer, it isn't raining or snowing. Technically, it's the same thing. Well, a telegram for me? A straight singing wire for Mr. Gerald Putnam. Are you he? I am he. You know darn well I am. Well, give her the vocal. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Joe Putnam. Happy birthday to you. Signed a loving friend who prefers to remain anonymous. I didn't quite get that message. You did so get that message. Besides, it's not your birthday at all. Your birthday's in February. Oh, I'm shocked, Miss Foster. I thought the motto of your company was the customer is always right. Well, you're an exception. Look, Judy, why don't you girls call off the strike? What are you mad at me for anyway, Judy? You know very well what I'm mad at you for. Is it because of that old picnic being stagged? It's a lot more than that. Well, then what is it? Well, when a man has been going steady with a girl for a whole week like you have with me, he, he, he isn't seen with a certain red-headed number from Glenville High School. Oh, but Judy, give me a chance. I'm not talking to you, Gerald Putnam. But you've been talking to me, Judy. I was talking to myself. And if you happen to overhear me, that's just too bad. <laughs> Foster, I'm so glad you're back. There's another singing telegram to be delivered in your territory. Yes, it's right. Uh, by my goodness, isn't this a coincidence? It's addressed to the self-same party, Mr. Gerald Putnam. Oh, caterpillars. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, Gerald Putnam. Happy anniversary to you. Sign the warm admirer. Lovely, lovely. Just how long have you been married, Mr. Putnam? <laughs> to Mother on Mother's Day. Though your hair has turned to silver, though your cheeks are wan and pale, we will th think of you forever and your years of hard travail. Sign your girl who loves you very much. Oh, that's sweet. Judy, how about a date? I wouldn't go out with you if you were my... my mother. Best wishes to you on Halloween. Salutations on Michaelmas. Greetings to you on Groundhog Day. We hope you have... Gerald Putnam, I never want to have anything to do with you again, either in person or in my professional capacity as a telegraph girl. Goodbye. <laughs> Randolph, as an idea, man, you're a dud. I've been sending telegrams to myself all day, and Judy hasn't even given me a tumble. You give me my quarter back. Now, hold on, Tim. I think I can save your investment. I have in my possession an idea that is so good it staggers even me. I'm not interested. At 50 cents, I'm practically giving this idea away. 50 cents? It's guaranteed to get Judy on a date. Well, okay. The curiosity is making a sucker out of me again. But here... What's the idea? Very simple. You start back with happy birthday and go through the whole thing all over again. Well, Ice Cube, we're home. 
I had an adorable time, Mr. Gerald Putnam. I had a fine time, too. Great experience. As the nearest I ever came to dating a clothing store, dummy. Thank you very much. That was a very lovely compliment. But remember, you wore me down. You positively coerced me into this thing. Oh, but gee whiz, Judy. Furthermore, if you don't like my company, you can go out with that red-headed beauty from Grenville High School. But I've been trying for hours to tell... I told you at the start of this evening that we're not indulging in any conversation on this date. You forget I'm on strike. Well, okay. I'll walk you up to the door. You needn't bother. Somebody might see us together. Good night, Mr. Putnam. Okay. Good night, Judy. What are you girls doing here? What do you think we're doing? You strike breaker. Wait a minute. Are you spying on me? You're darn right we are, Scab. Oh, why did you do it, Judy? After you took a solemn oath not to date men. But that wasn't really a date. I was only Come trying girls, to... girls, the prize is over now. Strike's over, too. I but Madam President... Judy Foster, after this, if you want to do any striking, it's going to be a one-woman strike. Oh, caterpillar. Hi, Father. Hello, Randolph. As the only one in this family who is talking to you, Father, I wanted you to know that I feel for you very deeply. In fact, condolences to you on Father's Day. Oh, well, thank you, son. Randolph, do you understand women? Yes, Father, I do. You do? Well, you've got something on me. Father, I hate to see you sitting in here, and the female element of our family sitting in the study, and never the twain shall meet. I'm an old fixer, Father. Do you think you can clear me with uh, Mrs. Foster? Well, for certain pecuniary remuneration, Father. <laughs> so, dear Randolph, you get your mother talking to me again, and I shall do but handsomely by you. Oh, but, Father... Before I can handle your case, I have to have complete frankness. Uh, frankness, Randy? Yes, Father. Were you at a political meeting at the athletic club, or were you at a stag party? Randolph, I'm going to tell you, man to man, in about 15 years from now. You and I are the only two women left on strike. You against Father and me against Gerald. Frankly, I don't think it's very effective. But we can't give in, Judy. It would be a confession of weakness. I'll get it. Hello? May I speak to Miss Judy Foster, please? Mr. Telegraph Office. Speaking? This isn't Mr. Sawyer, is it? No, this is Mr. Sawyer's superior. Your voice sounds very familiar. Oh, <clears throat> I uh, don't think we've met. I guess not. I haven't met many executives. <laughs> Funny, for a minute I thought you were my brother. <laughs> Ridiculous. Miss Foster, we've had a complaint from one of our customers. Who? The other evening you were supposed to deliver a message to a meeting at the athletic club. Were you not? Yes, sir. Well, it got to the wrong person. You delivered it to the stag party instead of to the political meeting. Miss Foster. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I... Well, in the future, be more careful. Good evening. Good evening. Mother, I'm in disgrace with the telegraph company. Why? What did you do? There were two meetings the other night at the athletic club. A stag party and a political meeting, and I delivered... A political such... meeting at the club the other night? Yes, I guess that's where I was supposed to go. That's where your father was supposed to go. But that's where he did go. Oh, the poor man, the injustice I've done him. Injustice? Oh, I can't wait till I see your father so I can ask him for a date. Oh, Judy, as of now, you are on a one-woman strike. Oh, lonely. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Judy. This is Randolph. Guess what I just found out? What? That redhead from Glenville High School is Gerald's first cousin. His cousin? Their relationship is purely as related. I extracted the information myself. Right out of the mouth of the redhead. I'm dying. Oh, poor Gerald. That's all the news for now. Goodbye. Oh, Mother, now that everything's all right, everything's all wrong. Why, dear? Gerald's been too blue to me all along, and I've been feeding him like a drink. 
Do you suppose he'll ever look at me again after the way I treated him? How can I ever face him? Oh, I'll get the door, dear. Oh, Grandma, you're beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. I love you, too. Uh, Gerald, you're a telegraph boy. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Judy, how about a rehearsal? Rehearsal? What for? Mr. Sawyer's orders. From now on, we're doing duets. A one, a two. I love you truly, truly, dear. Hold on, the story's not over. In a moment, we'll see what happens. But first, here's an important message from your government. There's an exciting, important new branch of the armed forces now forming, the Winged Commandos. The Wing Commandos will operate Uncle Sam's fast-growing glider force, and the U.S. Army Air Forces need thousands of men to become glider pilots. Tough, self-reliant men are needed for an all-out offensive against the enemy. And make no mistake, these Wing Commandos will be among the leaders in our smashing attacks to crush the Axis. You may be one of the men qualified for immediate training in the six weeks course at the new Army Air Forces Glider School. Listen to see if you are eligible. The Air Forces will accept the following men for training. If you are a civilian between 18 and 36 years of age who can pass an Army physical examination and now hold a pilot certificate of private grade or better, register at your nearest Civil Aeronautics Administration office. If you are a former aviation cadet with 50 hours or more of flying time at an Army, Navy, or Marine flying school who is not currently in the air services of the Armed Forces, register at the nearest CAA office or Army Air Corps headquarters. If you are an Army man who was a civilian pilot or has had flight training in the armed services, see your commanding officer. And if you can't meet these requirements, you still get your chance. Men between 18 and 36 may apply to any one of the 600 colleges of the Civil Aeronautics Administration to take a preliminary course for glider pilot training. When you complete this schooling, you are then eligible to take the regular Army Air Forces glider course. America is growing wings, big wings, fighting wings. Get your wings as a glider pilot. Join the wing commandos now. Gerald, before Judy comes downstairs, I've got a piece of man man advice for you. Keep clear of stag parties. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Foster. We've already called off our stag picnic. Say, does anybody remember me? Randolph Foster, the old fixer-upper? Well, yes, yeah, say thanks, Randolph. <laughs> that phony phone call you made saved my life. I'll pay you back someday. I'm a cash-on-the-line man, Father. Fee for impersonating the telegraph company, 75 cents. Well, okay. Here you are, Randolph. And as for you, Gerald, my fee is one American dollar. Haven't you bled me enough? <laughs> what did you do for Gerald that was worth a dollar? One of the toughest assignments of my career. I converted a Glenville High School redhead into a first cousin. invited to have another date with Judy next Tuesday night. A date with Judy with Deli Ellis and Dix Davis is written by Jerome Lawrence and Aline Lester. Original music by Gordon Jenkins. And remember, for the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Larry Keating speaking. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI, Los Angeles, Earl C. Anthony Incorporated, California Parker Distributors.